You may be seated. As you're seated, I invite you to pray with me. So let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this first Sunday of Advent. We pray that as Christmas is coming, we might turn our hearts and minds to hear a word of good news, just like the words spoken to Zechariah, that we might hear you speaking to us anew during this time, and by your word be transformed into your love in the world. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, Christmas is now here, right? Our sanctuary is decorated. Although Christmas isn't here, we have this other word for it called Advent. And Advent is a peculiar thing. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, I just got asked over this past week, so I'm just going to recap it, okay? Advent is a liturgical season in the church calendar year, and it is a different season than Christmas, which is where uh, in all throughout popular culture and society, it's Christmas time, and we have Christmas songs, and we have this, and or the holiday season, whatever you want to call it. But Advent is unique insofar as Advent is a time that the church actually waits to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Uh, let me give you an example of how hard this is for us, and uh, it comes with my daughter, Stella. She's uh, just turning seven in a few months, and Stella loves this time. Our, our kids just like, it's so hard to decorate our house because the minute the boxes for Christmas come out, it's like a switch gets turned off in the kids, and like they're all of a sudden super excited and just like ready. I don't know, like the, everything about this season they love, and they're just like running around, hopping, all of these things. And Stella the other day was just like been waiting every day because we uh, decided to decorate a little bit early, um, and we decided decorated before Thanksgiving. And so every morning she would wake up and she would say, "Where's Elf on the Shelf?" And I don't know if you know, Elf on the Shelf is this new little mythical creature that shows up every morning in houses that decide to buy it from Target. And they have different things that they're doing. Like, so Elf will be like, show up in one part of the house one day and then another part of the house with candy. And it's just the exciting thing that kids are like, look forward to. And, you know, so she was like, ready for the Elf to come. And so we're like, no, the book says, because it comes with the book, book says after Thanksgiving, right? So you at least have to wait after Thanksgiving giving, let alone Advent, right? Like it should wait, we should also wait to Advent. And so she waited for Elf on the Shelf. Elf on the Shelf came after Thanksgiving. And then we have this like Advent tree that was gifted to us by a church member uh, from a few churches past where I was at. And it has these little like flip numbers, like the days. So like one is a day and then you take off this little ornament, it has a Bible verse on the back and you hang it on the Christmas tree. And no joke, day one, Stella's ready. She gets it. She got Elf on the Shelf. She did the Advent calendar. And that night, that night is like, Christmas is tomorrow, right? Like Christmas is tomorrow. And she was convinced. And I was like, no, Stella, Christmas is not tomorrow. And that turned into, what? It's not tomorrow? What, 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 what's going on? Like it's Christmas and Christmas time. I put the ornaments. And I was like, no, Stella, you got to get all the ornaments on the tree. It's 24 days now before it's Christmas Eve. And then it'll be Christmas, right? It's just excruciating for us to wait to celebrate Christmas. And, you know, especially in our current culture where we don't have to wait for anything. We don't have to wait to go to the library because I can just download a Kindle book like right now, right? I don't have to wait to go get a CD. What's a CD anymore? You just download the playlist from whatever you stream from. You don't have to wait for your Redbox DVD or from Blockbuster to watch a movie. You need, some of you, you know, know what I'm talking about. You just go online and you get what you want to watch and it's right there. It is a like instant gratification culture and context. And so we find ourselves in this season of waiting, season of waiting. And it's a peculiar season in the church as well, because it's also a season where all year round, and one of the foundational claims that I make uh, as a Christian is that God is with us. God is with us. But during this season, we also acknowledge that God is coming, that God is coming. And there's this dual tension when we acknowledge that God is with us, but God is coming because it's acknowledging an incompleteness. Like it, it's not whole until God comes. In fact, the theology behind Advent is that we're waiting for the parousia, 
the second coming of Jesus, and we relive the story of Jesus' birth, or as we anticipate Jesus' birth, because we're waiting for Jesus to come back. Because there is an irony with our story of Jesus, that God is with us, and that is that the earth has not been fully redeemed, or the experience of it, I should say, is not. And what do I mean by that is I mean that the earth has not been fully redeemed and reconciled as we haven't experienced that because look around. Open your news, talk to your loved ones. There is pain and there is heartache and there is weariness here. And so even though Christ has come, we acknowledge during this time that Christ is still coming, that God is coming back to finish the work that Jesus started so long ago, and we remember that by remembering that Jesus came, God came, in the first place. And so we, like, have to put off our hat that says, gives us comfort and says, Jesus is always with us, and look to the future, and we sing a song so peculiar, and we say, O come, O come, Emmanuel, to ransom captive Israel. We sing a song longing for freedom, longing for hope, longing for something new. And it's a weird thing if you think about it. Every year I sing this song, and as I've been thinking about this weariness, I think about that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that we begin with. And and isn't it odd that we say, come, come, and fix our problems And then, rejoice, rejoice. How many of you in the midst of your hard circumstances are, you know, like, rejoice, rejoice, you know, like that you're ready to be happy in those times? In the same instant gratification that wants to move us to Christmas and open up our presents right away is this desire to move beyond to the pain and the hardship. And I think that part of it is is our longing for what we think we want versus a longing for the gifts that Jesus brings. And each of the Advent candles will remind us, and the Advent candles are hope, peace, joy, and love. Those are the gifts that Jesus brings, and the gift of joy and hope are not always what we want them to be. Because we want to be happy. We want to be through the dark tunnel. We want it to look like the expectations that we have set in our minds. And we want to get past as quickly as we can. And so something about waiting in this time is hard and painful. And when pain comes or darkness comes, we ask questions and we say, Why God? Why now? Why? And those questions aren't bad. This season asks another question. It's not another question, it's a plea. Come. Not why now, why me, but come, O God, the one who will redeem all. Come and bring the gifts that you promise in Christ. This past year uh, has been a, a doozy for our family. Um, if you didn't know, my wife is uh, super courageous. She, like, went, we both did our undergraduate degree in youth ministry at Azusa Pacific, and she uh, worked with at-risk youth for a number of years, and then she transitioned to help our kids at home um, afterwards. And then now that the kids are in grade school, she's looked at, like, what, where am I going to put my energy and effort? And, you know, really wisely, she discerned that she wanted to go into the medical profession right before COVID hit. So she, like, signed up for her, like, community college classes to, like, become a nurse, and then all of a sudden, March, COVID hits. And then she kept going. And this past year, she had this year intensive. I mean, any of you, how many of you know someone who was in nursing school when you were in college, right? Or you know someone that's gone through it? I mean, they were always the craziest, right? Like, they just, like, were studying all the time, like, super anxious because the tests were really intense, and, like, they were, like, doing all things. And, and I just know I had a number of friends that were in my nursing, my school had a good nursing program. It's just, they were, like, they never had time to hang out because they were always studying. 
Well, so nursing school is hard, if you didn't know. So is a lot of professions. But nursing school, I think, has a, a history of being especially hard. And so Ashley did it in one year. She got her bachelor's, she already had her bachelor's degree, and she went back and she did her whole BSN, like all of the nursing stuff, in a one-year intensive called the Geppen program at UH Manoa. And so last year at this time was her first finals time. And she had five undergraduate classes at the exact same time, all nursing classes. And it was like a firestorm hit our family. Like, I mean, it was just like, just studying all the time, a new quiz, a new test. And it was hard. It was really hard, right? Like you can imagine school is hard, nursing school is hard, intensive nursing school is hard and having kids. And so we were hard and we were tired. And it was just so, we were so worried too. Like, what if we can't make it, right? We've invested all this money, and what if you fail a class or something? And I remember, like, a week after this was the finals, and her hardest class was pharmacology. And pharmacology, she was so worried about it. And then the, now, nowadays, you get the instant results, right? You know, you don't have to wait a week, right? It's like you hit beep, send, and then it's like, here's your results. And so she took this test, and it's like this agonizing time. Like, I can't, like, talk to her for the four hours she's taking the test. And she texts back and she, I don't even remember, it was like an A or something, of course it was. But like she got like an A and no joke, I started crying, right? It, is such, it was so hard and so difficult that you didn't know you can make it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh. And tears come. And those tears are not happy tears. I'm not like, yes, this is the best thing ever. But those tears of joy and hope are directly linked to the seasons of weariness that we have. Just the other day, I was listening to the BBC World News, and I was just, and as you know, they have all sorts of things. If you ever listen to BBC World News, I love it. It's a podcast, super easy, 30 minutes. But they had, the beginning was, of course, talking about Gaza and Israel, Hamas and Israel. And it was during the truce period that just ended. And it was amazing because on both sides, they started interviewing what it was like for hostages and prisoners to come back. And in the midst of war, in the midst of all the chaos, people were singing and rejoicing. And they were crying in joy because their loved one had come home. And you know the time when you cried tears of hope. You know the time when you're in that moment, right? And then all of a sudden this glimmer comes. We have this song that we sing oftentimes in churches, especially in Christmas time, called O Holy Night. Anyone ever it? And that's part of our theme. Is a how does a weary world rejoice? Because how's the song go? A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. It's not complete. Everything's not done. We weren't done with Ashley's program at this time last year. The war has not ended in Gaza, but it's this thrill, this little just glimmer of hope that can bring tears that allow us to endure and to take on a journey. And so we must not move away so quickly from the hardship, but we should look for the glimmer and pray for the glimmers of hope. And during this season, especially, what it takes is community. We need community. Zachariah and Elizabeth were isolated because at the time it, it, it would feel like if you're barren, you're especially on the women, it was like you couldn't be part of community and whole because there was something wrong with you. There was something not right. And the angel of the Lord reveals to Zachariah, no, there is in fact hope that we can, in fact, move forward, that something is going to happen. And in this story, it happens the way that they hoped, and not all stories happen the way that we expect or anticipate. 
But there's something about this proclamation that also allows Elizabeth to come and be back part of community. We hold hope for others that can't hold hope during this season. We'll know of friends, of loved ones, of colleagues that will have lost a loved one, remembering the anniversary of a loss, that are going through the difficulties of a fractured relationship. We know weariness in this world. And if you're not ready to go to the hope yet, that's okay, because weariness also makes way for the thrill of hope. But what we can do as a community, those of us that might not be weary, those of us that aren't in the year I was in last year, is to hold the hope, is to wait and pray for those tears of joy and of hope to finally break in for our friend, our loved one, to see that little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel. And so there's no, like, take away, this is what we do, other than to pray, other than to cry out, O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Bring us hope. This is a gift that we're longing for. We want hope where there's war. We want hope where there's despair. Where there is weariness, turn what was weary into this joy that Christ brings. So let us wait in anticipation this Advent, even if it's hard to remember that Christ is coming. The weary world will rejoice. And there is a shrill or thrill of hope. Let us find it, let us be patient for it, and let us hold it up and wait for that experience for those we know and love. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we give thanks that you bring us hope and that you don't move us past the difficulties too quickly. And so during this season, we wait on you. And with all the weariness in our own lives and in the world around us, we pray, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and bring us hope. Amen.